Hello and welcome to the Air and Space Museum here in Washington DC and behind me is not a replica but the actual original Wright Flyer that first flew in 1903. It's an incredible artifact and in this video I'm going to take you on a guided tour around it. I'm Paul Stewart and I make videos about planes and a few rockets. If you're into reviews of flights from around the world and detailed tours through interesting aircraft and museums then please check out my channel and subscribe. This very aircraft made the first ever sustained flight by a manned, heavier than air powered and controlled craft and it was incredible seeing it in the metal, well mostly wooden fabric with a little metal. It is kept in these low light conditions to help preserve it which is frustrating filming but completely understandable as this really is a precious piece of history. I'll swap to my other camera shortly and I'll start with the aircraft itself and finish up with a few other displays including part of this that was carried to the moon in Apollo 11. We will walk towards the front and it's difficult to tell which is forward so it's best to look at the pilot to orientate yourself. Now usually pitch which is up and down is controlled at the rear with elevators but being the first plane they were starting from scratch and decided to put it at the front. This obstructed the view a little but reduced complexity with the tail which has the rudder to control. The elevators at the front were controlled by a direct connection between this lever in the pilot's left hand. I suppose that having this structure at the front also provides some physical protection for the pilot if they did crash land. Automotive engines at the time were so heavy that the Wright brothers actually designed their own and used some aluminium components such as the crankshaft casing to reduce the weight then they painted it all black to hide the idea from competitors. You'll notice that the engine is slightly to the right of the centre of gravity and that's simply because the pilot would be sitting left of centre so the equilibrium would be maintained. It had four cylinders in a horizontal layout and produced around 12 horsepower which was enough for the aircraft which weighed 605 pounds when empty. This large object here is the aluminium crankshaft and casing and moving away from that is the chain and sprocket transmission linkages and we will look at those more later. This here is the fuel tank that uses gravity to draw the fuel down into the engines and this large structure here is the radiator as this was water cooled. Later radial engines would be air cooled although this was never going to go fast enough to generate enough cooling wind. You've got the Richard anemometer here and this is the original one from the very first day and this was used to measure wind speed. Here's a quick look at the Wright military flyer from another video and it has the original cloth so you can see how much oil has leaked from the engine. And now back to the Wright flyer. This here is the magneto which uses magnets to make electricity for the spark plugs. We will look at the propellers shortly but let's take a step back and look at the wings. It was a biplane setup which generated maximum lift at a relatively low speed. As engines became more powerful and aircraft moved faster, a single wing would provide sufficient lift after experimentations with the bi and triplanes in the early years of aviation. It was made of wood and fabric and while that fabric on this one has been replaced twice back in 1927 and then 1985, here's footage of the original material on display here. The unbleached muslin is obviously extremely light and strong enough for the relatively low speeds. Originally they only covered the outer side of the wooden frame with the fabric although they later added an inner layer that improved the airflow and reduced the drag. They used ash wood for curved components of the wing and spruce for the straight members such as the wing spars. The pilot would lie flat on this hip cradle here and would move their body weight which would pull on the wires that would warp the wings and simultaneously turn the rudder. This would allow him to turn either left or right and again the lever in his left hand would be used to control the elevator at the front for pitch up and down. This rear structure here is the rudder which controls the yaw movements. If you look closely as I zoom in on the hip cradle you can make out the cables which are directly connected to deform the wing and move the rudder. It's a simple design yet works perfectly well. You'll notice that there are no wheels, in fact it just used these landing skids. Remember that cars were barely invented so wheels weren't as obvious as they might be now. They would have also added a lot of weight as well. The aircraft was launched from a flat track that you can see here and this kept it above the uneven ground. This here is a launch dolly from 1909 similar to that used in 1903 although the original no longer exists. 
Looking at the rear, you can see these two propellers which were 2.6 meters long, very thin and turned quickly. They had to build these themselves because the only other propeller design that used by ships were much smaller and had thicker blades. They were directly connected to the engine by bicycle chains, with one train being twisted 180 degrees so that it spun the propeller in the opposite direction so that they would cancel out each other's lateral momentum, which would otherwise make the whole plane yaw. This here is one of the propellers from the first flight in 1903. It was damaged later that day and then replaced. This is also fascinating here. An actual piece of the original fabric and wood from this Wright flyer was carried to the moon by the Apollo 11 crew in 1969. This here is a telegraph key that the Wright brothers used to inform their father of their success. You'll notice that they actually misspelled Orville's name and incorrectly said the longest flight was 57 seconds instead of the 59 seconds that it actually was. These two watches here are from the first flights. On the left, this stopwatch was used to record the four flights, and on the right, Orville carried this pocket watch on the very first one of them. The wing ribs were constructed of two thin strips of ash with small blocks between them, unlike the steam bent and solid wing ribs of earlier gliders. This aircraft flew four times on the first day, with the first being 12 seconds over 120 feet. The longest was 59 seconds and 852 feet, although Wilbur crash landed, damaging the elevator system. Unfortunately, a wind gust shortly afterwards toppled it over and destroyed it beyond repair. It then spent time in storage, almost getting thrown out, before going on display in the UK and the United States once they realised the significance of it. In 1948, it was put on display at the Smithsonian. It was sad to see the original Wright flyer grounded, although it's great to see that it's being so well looked after now, as it really is an incredible historical artifact and needs to be preserved for the future. Please check out my video exploring the first military aircraft in the world, the 1909 Wright military flyer, on my channel and many other aviation videos. Thanks for watching.